Why do doctors commit suicide at a rate that is much, much, much higher than almost any other profession, including even dentists? Now in this video, I wanna share an actual live, in-person, unscripted podcast interview I did with a colleague who has a channel and a podcast on herbal medicine in the integrative medicine sphere. So come on over, check it out. I'm gonna show you that clip of this interview where we were talking about this very important topic and our own opinions and observations on why that may be true. Why do you think that is? What, what do you think is leading this suicide epidemic amongst physicians? I think it's, it's also like a yin-yang thing where it's one part internal, one part external, where I think the inner part is just that, like no one who's really fulfilled or really happy and content and has a meaningful life kills himself, obviously. So I think whatever leads to those internal factors, whether it is that, like you look at the profession of physician and in our modern world, because this wasn't like this in ancient times, in the modern world, that's a very prestigious title that makes a lot of money. And prestige and money attract a lot of people, including people not interested in a field. So I think part of it is like a lot of physicians have family lineages of medicine and a lot of people go into it who don't actually really like medicine. I think that's one piece of it. And I think the other piece is just the external piece, which is just that you're working crushing hours. You have however many few minutes with a patient. There's a ton of pressure. And frankly, people can just be like really mean. I mean, if you look at the malpractice insurance for a physician, what is it like almost six figures a mm -hmm. year or more? Especially for surgeons. Especially surgeons. Yeah, like you look at that. That's like, I'm paying this much to not be afraid, right? And like such a litigious society where you're afraid of, you make an honest mistake and someone like sues you for all you have. That's pretty scary, you know? I mean, those are my best guesses, but I think a lot of it is just that deep kind of, a lot of it is just, I think, the compassion fatigue too, where you're helping people and you even just see like the same person come in, like the diabetic, right? Like a case study, the diabetic, they come in, you see the blood sugar numbers, you see the A1C, and then eventually what happens is, let's, let's make it extreme, they need an amputation, like their foot or below the knee. But then nothing changes. They don't change the diet. They don't change anything, despite that really serious consequence. And it almost leads you to feel like, like, why bother? Like a lot of these people are going to do the same thing no matter what I say. And mm -hmm. so it's kind of like you're the Pez dispenser. You don't like what you're doing or even maybe what you're giving. Maybe you know it doesn't even really work in the long term, but that's kind of all you have. And you are not even allowed to because of the AMA and the system set up for you in medicine. You can't even... Uh, do anything different from that prescribed advice or else that's malpractice. Right. And so if you're it's practicing alongside uh, regulations of insurance companies right. and what they'll reimburse, it forces a certain kind of uh, practice like the, you know, physician sees, you know, 10 patients an hour or right. something ridiculous that really no person can possibly handle. And in, in such a stressful position where what you decide has such a big impact on right. somebody's life. Right. And then on top of that, there's uh, something you were alluding to, the lack of uh, fulfillment in the profession that um, some physicians might feel like they're facing this this giant uh, conventional medical system insurance companies right. that they can't overcome. And they feel like their actions don't actually make that much of a difference in right. somebody's life. And I mean, how much of a difference can you make in somebody's life if you only see them for like two minutes? Yeah, and right. You don't even know their first name. Right. And then I think like I think all physicians, just like all humans, want meaning and purpose in their work and their life. And so it's almost like a system that they're forced to work in that makes them have this meaningless surface meeting with every patient mm. where it's just like, all right, I'm a Pez dispenser, even though I don't really want that. And they don't have like an hour where they can just talk about life, see what's really going on. They can actually have the opportunity to do anything deeper. So I think they're almost barred from having meaning unless they view the act of like, let me just do this. And that's like, this is supposed to be like, this is just my role that I play. Because so I, think, I, I think a big piece is just that there's like the external system set up preventing them from doing what they want from any of them. And there's also just the internal, you know, maybe a lot of them didn't go into the right profession because it was something that really intrigued them, but it was just something that seemed like maybe a good decision or a family decision. And that's that's partially one of the very hard crushing things is a lot of uh, physicians, MDs, DOs, they went into medicine with a very pure idea. They yeah. really wanted to help people. Right. 
Uh, but you know, then they practice for a couple of years and they become completely jaded. In fact, I hear very often from a lot of uh, family practice doctors, um, a lot of MDs, that when a student comes to them, you know, all excited and bushy-tailed about medicine and I want to help people and can you tell me how you heal and all this? And these doctors are saying, don't do it. Yeah. Don't go into this field. It's not what you think it right. is. More than 50% of the last survey I saw, more than 50% would not recommend like their own kid to go into medicine. Wow. <laughs> That's saying something, man. That's like if, yeah, exactly. That's like the divorce rate, right? So it's like if what we're all doing collectively results in a 50% divorce rate, Obviously, the decisions, the decision-making process to get married is not correct. Something's, something's going something's wrong, like 100% chance right, of that. Right, right. Yeah. And then you look at, same with medicine, where like almost no one can recommend it. And yet there are still, the medical schools are getting more and more filled up. The requirements are getting more and more stringent. It's like, what? It's like the, almost like the marketing team for medicine is like really, really strong, but the product fulfillment is really, really awful. So it's like you have all this marketing around the iPhone and it's just a shit product. Mm -hmm. It's like that kind of weird, weird complex with medicine. Not to get off too off topic, but we were just complaining about how the new Apple products have all these ridiculous dongles <laughs> that you have to buy. Exhibit A. Like I have this thing connected to my computer. It looks like it's giving birth to like a little machine baby. Yeah. Um, and you basically can't use any connections to the you know, laptop without that. Right. Um, completely off topic, but it's an example of ridiculous moves by companies. Yeah. Um, so what do you think actually leads physicians to taking their own life? So there's obviously a difference between someone who is not fulfilled in their work and right. is depressed, um, feels like they don't have meaning in life, and somebody who actually takes their life because of that. Right. I guess that's like the big question, why do some people go through depression or difficulties and they decide to commit suicide versus people that just go into depression or people that are resilient? that are like, I'm going to use this as the impetus to actually do something. I guess ultimately we don't know, but I think with a lot of suicide, there's a feeling that whatever hole I'm in, I can't get out of. Like, it's just the hole's too deep. I can't get out of it. And that sense of hopelessness. And I think with physicians, there's, I don't know if we have stats on the average age of suicide, but it'd be interesting to see because I think there's some aspect of, well, I have prestige. I probably also have money. Maybe they have student loans still a lot, or maybe they don't. But there's maybe a feeling of, well, what else am I going to do, right? Or I'm a doctor. Like, I'm, like, one of the most respected people in society. Like, what would it be like to kind of crawl back my tail between my legs and become, like, a nursery school teacher? That, like, fulfills me, but it's, like, an embarrassing job mm. with no respect. So you think there's some element of ego Always. Uh, placed in there? I think all the people, I mean, this with all due respect, I think everyone I know that's committed suicide, there's always an element of ego. There's always, I mean, because... Shame is a big part of suicide, right. right? Like the even if it's the shame or the discomfort with confronting people and being mm -hmm. like, no, I'm actually not. Number one, I'm not doing well. I'm actually doing awful. And number two, mm -hmm. like I, I, these choices I have to make in my life are so insurmountable, and they're often ego based reasons. Mm. It just gave me a, a little bit of an insight. Where do the healers go to get healed? Who does a doctor talk to? They're supposed to know right. why they're ill. Uh, mentally or otherwise. Right. In fact, it's it's pretty common for uh, psychiatrists, psychologists to actually become interested in that field of medicine right. because they deal with their own mental issues. And we know that um, at our own school, a lot of people come in um, with all sorts of pre-existing medical conditions. They have chronic illnesses, this and that. Yeah. And a lot of ways that inspires them to follow medicine. Right. It's kind of that that archetypal myth of Chiron. Uh, the Wounded Healer, it's called. It's an incredibly interesting story. But it's basically, it's about the healer that themselves becomes uh, basically lethally poisoned by uh, an arrow in the story and can't cure themselves. Mm. And they have to always suffer with it. And it's kind of like the idea that the healers suffer for other people. Right. Isn't part of the Chiron story also that, I forget whoever granted Chiron his powers, but that either his powers could be revoked so he would lose his powers but then he would die oh, he was given but he option. maintained yeah but he can maintain his powers but be wounded forever so it's like this dual mm. this dual like anima animus yin and yang archetype mm. I just heard the story recently in China again from someone else and that was her uh, that's her recounting of it but that, that's a big question I think that's why 
a lot of the indigenous healers that were traditionally the physician slash spiritual advisor, they all had their own tools for, for like self physician heal thyself, right? Like that kind of thing mm. that you don't see a lot of in modern medicine. You don't, you actually don't really see a lot of even ethics, like ethical training in modern medicine. And there's probably like one class in ethics in medical school, but like individual, like what are you really going to do to take good care of yourself? Right. I mean, uh, most recently they've been adding in uh, to the MCATs, the medical um, admissions test before you go to medical school, mm -hmm. uh, a whole section on all the social studies, social sciences, that really? kind of stuff. Yeah, because even the culture at large is realizing that there is a lack of a humanistic element right. in uh, medical schools and they're trying to actually test for it now. But right. People are going to be studying out of a textbook how to be ethical. Right. It seems kind of ridiculous. Well, I think this is one of those things where it's just like in a company, <clears throat> medical school, and any really professions that have high performers, top, top performers. If you reward performance, you don't reward integrity. Mm. So you don't reward ethical decision making. Mm. So it's the same in a company. If you say, I'm going to give you a bonus for getting this best, you sell this package to this client, you don't, re you don't reward honesty. And so I think that's the problem also in medicine. If you're saying, we're the creme de la creme, we're only taking the top 1% of students. Well, okay, you're gonna get the straight A students, but what do they have going on the rest of their life? And I think that's also why medical schools now highly value extracurriculars. All right, guys, thanks for tuning in. I think, of course, it's always a big question, who heals the healer? Or who is the healer of the healer? And if we don't do a good job of taking care of ourselves and modeling what a healthy, cultivated person looks like, I don't think our patients are likely to do that either. That's just my opinion. Now, of course, if you'd like to stay in touch, the first link in the description is for a free PDF on five daily rituals to help you add 10 years to your life with traditional Chinese medicine. So you can check it out, the first link in the description, and then check out my last related videos right there and right there.